I'm so excited to be able to open up PyCon APAC with this amazing keynote that I think is going to be very exciting as we talk about community and this conference kicks off. So without further ado, the name of this talk is What Comes Next? The Future of the PSF and the Python Open Source Community. All slides are available on the bit.ly link here, bit.ly forward slash lmesa dash PyCon APAC. Some information about me. My name is Lorena Mesa, and I do a lot of things with Python and a few things also in, the, in technology as well. I organize PyLady Chicago. I'm chairperson and director of the Python Software Foundation. I am an engineer at GitHub, and I'm a huge proponent and champion of responsible computer science. If you were ever looking to have a discussion with me, you can find me on most places on the web with my very long handle, at Lorena Nicole. Like all of us in the Python community, we are a unique makeup of our interests and passions. I'm highly motivated and driven by questions of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I try to channel my work into many communities that think about this in technology, including Django Girls, and also working with organizations that are based in my hometown of Chicago, like the Chicago Tech Diversity Ini Ini Initiative, of which I'm a founding me member. I also actively contribute to civic tech projects like the Data for Democracy movement. Outside of technology, though, I'm also an avid runner, martial artist, and I'm a bit of a huge sci-fi geek. Spe specifically, I am a Trekkie, live long and prosper, or as I like to say, live long, prosper, and Python. Um, and you can often find me at fan conventions sporting a red shirt. And yes, I'm very aware that the red shirt is often the first to go in the series when you're never introduced to them. <sighs> but that's okay. My passions, especially my passions for running, is something that many people do not fully understand about me. Running an annual 26.2 miles, something around 43 kilometers for fun, doesn't sound to most people to be that fun. I try to tell people about my motivation for running by turning to a favorite author of mine, Haruki Murakami, who I think answers this question well in his memoir titled, What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. In the memoir, Murakami draws inspiration from a title of a series of stories on love titled, What We Talk About When We Talk About Love by Raymond Carve. In that collection of stories, each one explores the theme from a different perspective and inspires the reader to draw their own conclusions. Running for Murakami is the same idea here. It holds a very, it ha, it holds very special significance to Murakami in the same way that I am an avid runner. So in his memoir, the what I talk about when I talk about running, Murakami compares running to his own creative process, as well as his own outlook in life, stating, for me, running is both exercise and a metaphor. Running day after day, piling up the races, bit by bit, I raise the bar. And by clearing each level, I elevate myself. At least that's why I've put in the effort day after day to raise my own level. I'm no great runner by any means. I'm ordinary, or perhaps more like at a mediocre level. But that's not the point. The point is whether or not I improved over yesterday. In long distance running, the only opponent you have to beat is yourself, the way you used to be. Running for me is much like technology. The work we put into technology determines the outcomes of what we can do with it and how we can use technology to improve our own position in life and to improve our community and also change the direction that society is developing for the future. So to think about why I joined the Python community, I wanted to tell you a little, a little story about where I come from or my origin story, where and how I became involved in the technology space. So I am from Chicago, as I mentioned momentarily before, a Midwestern city in the United States, home to such fine people as Barack and Michelle Obama, or fantastic Pythonistas like Naomi Seder, Cedar, David Beasley, and Eva Jodlowska. Chicago is also home to many things, including the first skyscraper, the home insurance building that was 
built in 1884. The first Ferris wheel and also were the creators of the deep dish pizza, which I'm sorry to say, I don't think Chicagoans really eat. Our great city has had great influence in the United States in the late 1890s through the early 1900s. When we both, when we hosted the World Fair, the World Fair and helped build a vision of the world that inspired many people, people like Walt Disney, whose father worked on building the small mini country exhibits like Little Germany. What is so interesting about those small mini countries that were used in the World's Fair actually went, were actually built to be a reflection of the world as well as a celebration of all of the countries in the world. So Walt Disney seeing the celebration of the world in Chicago at that time actually helped him think about how he could build out the Disney project and the Disney experience. Again, Disney being this vision of a better world for all of us together. However, with great wealth can come great change and Chicago began to lose influence and power as manufacturing jobs dried up and new regional hubs became the seats of industry and power. What was left behind was a beautiful city, but sadly a city of many different lived experiences. With the loss of status and industry came a loss of revenue and opportunity for Chicagoans. Over the last 40 years, Chicago has seen what many formerly industrial what many formerly industrialized cities in the United States have seen. Those with wealth, with money, continue to, to have more and more power and wealth, while those with less means continue to sink into poverty. The middle class seeing these changes all but fled to the suburbs. Chicago is now considered to be one of, if not the most segregated city in the United States. As you can see in this map here, the populations within Chicago are heavily concentrated around racial communities, with the white population living in the more wealthy north side and the Latino and black communities being concentrated in underinvested parts of the city, specifically the south and southwest sides. It isn't random chance that these areas that have more communities of color and less wealth also happen to be the areas that are the most policed and with the least access to resources, resources like fresh grocery stores, transportation, and healthcare. The struggles of Chicago and building a community that is equitable to all Chicagoans is not a unique story. It's actually something though we all care about. However, Chicago has been a leader in talking about equity in the United States, uh, in the United States political scene, as well as heard around the world. So around the time I was entering the workforce and graduating from Northwestern University, just north of Chicago, there was a specific Chicagoan who was seeing these struggles and wanted to do something more. He wanted to bring about change. And who was this person? No other than former Illinois Senator Barack Obama. His message of unity and hope and for change we can believe in was one that motivated me deeply. I'm a first generation American citizen with parents from Mexico and Cuba. The idea that we can build better tomorrow was intrinsic to my family story and something I strongly believe in. By working together and placing empathy at the core of the work we do, we can change the world for the better. Joining the, <coughs> excuse me, joining the Obama campaign as a staffer, working on the Latino vote effort, I was charged with several tasks including event management, outreach and data analytics to help crunch numbers to understand how we can pull better, develop better messaging to increase our probability of victory and more. What was game changing about this campaign too was the novel use of something we all know well, the internet. As Ariana Huffington of the Huffington Post infamously said, were it not for the internet, Barack Obama would not be president. Were it not for the internet, Barack Obama would not have been the nominee. The ways we saw the use of the internet at play and the tactics that included the internet were such things as the extensive use of social media in this campaign. For example, holding town halls, that is where people come together and discuss issues that are important to them on YouTube. Or get out to the vote, GOTV drives that were informed by data science. That is targeting places where you could register people to vote and using data science to help us find where to have those registration drives. And of course, who can forget the many, many different special interest groups for Obama, such as Latinos for Obama, women for Obama, et cetera, et cetera, all of which was customized based around 
the messaging that we were pulling and seeing worked with our communities. By, customiz by customizing the campaign messaging with specific language and tools like social media, we could more accurately determine what campaign, what campaign strategies worked, who our supporters were, and what they cared about. And some of the skills we used on the campaign, well, predictive analytics. Given some percentage of turnout, how likely were we to win? How many more people would we need to register to vote in order for us to win a specific state? Sentiment analysis. How did people understand and feel towards us in the campaign? And then mapping. How could we allocate our resources the best on the ground in our key voting states? These type of problems, which can be solved by data science, drew from so many areas of expertise, including areas like math and programming. And how did I learn to develop some of these skills? That's right, Python. Something to know about Python in Chicago is that the Python community in Chicago is huge. We have many users and also an awesome user group called the Chicago Python User Group, or Chippy, like a chipmunk for short. Founded in 2003, Chippy is one of the most active user groups in the world, with more than 3,000 members and many famous alumni, like some of the folks I mentioned earlier, David Beasley, Naomi, Naomi Cedar, uh, Eva Jodlowska. This is a community that has many special interest groups and teaching programs. For example, the mentorship program with, with tracks in Python 101, Python and web development, Python and data science. These are some of the types of spaces I would participate in to help me grow my skill set. When I saw that there was poor representation of women in, the, in, in Chippy, and not because Chippy was alienating, but because unfortunately there wasn't as much beginner-friendly content that the Chippy was offering at the time, I decided to start Pi Lady Chicago. Fun fact, Naomi was one of the first speakers for Pi Lady Chicago. I found her through LinkedIn, and as I joke, I politely asked, or maybe I told her, uh, that Naomi needed to do a workshop for us, and that she did. From the start of my time working in Python then, Python has always been a community that teaches and embraces everyone. It's marked by mentorship, friendship, and learning. And it is a community that has little patience for bigotry or go read the manual type learning. The community is what makes Python, well, Python. So now that I've told you a little bit about how I got into Python, I'm going to continue to give you maybe a not so unbiased, but very opinionated review of why Python has been so successful. Now, we've probably seen this, this graphic a few times before, but in Stack, Stack Overflow's 2017 survey really started reflecting on this idea of, wow, Python's growing at an incredible rate. How is this happening? Um, as we see in June of 2017, the most visited tag, Python, on Stack Overflow had grown 27% over the previous year. So why then were we seeing this? To help us understand this growth, let's, cons let's consider some emerging trends with Python. In Jake Founderplass's 2017 PyCon keynote, he discussed four reasons for the unexpected effectiveness of Python in science. And while he may have been talking about Python in science, I think these lessons are applicable to Python in general. Firstly, he specified that Python is a language that plays well with others. So for example, if you work in science or you do scientific programming, you have scientists of all different types of discipline studying all different types of questions. For, we might have ecologists who are looking for reproducible ecological patterns and maybe programming with libraries like MacroEco or astronomers using Python to take an image of a black hole. All these scientists will need to work in diff, will need to work with different types of data sets, different size of data sets, it may be structured, may be unstructured. It can be stored in all different types of databases. And sometimes these, these tools that they use might be written in MATLAB or in R or C++, C++ just to name a few languages. Now, considering that scientists have to work in all different types of languages, we also see from research that the Python community has been conducting in, in conjunction with JetBrains in the annual Python developer survey that there's an, uh, an ever broadening perspective of use cases for Python. So in the 2018 report, we saw that 58% of folks said that data analysis was amongst their primary use case, 52% saying web development, 
45% saying DevOps and 38% saying machine learning. What we see then from the ways in which the scientific community has been really investing in developing and using all these Python tools is because Python is able to bridge the gap and work well alongside other languages. And as we see then, it also has many broad use cases. So again, Python is able to act as glue, helping glue various components together and therefore be useful in many different types of use cases. Python is also a language with a robust ecosystem, meaning that there are many well-developed and useful modules. The Python standard library itself is a prime example of how many useful tools that can be used without having to literally reinvent the wheel and go write a custom solution yourself. So we can look no further than the Python package index just to see how true this is. So uh, in, on Thursday, November 18th in Chicago time, the Python package index had something around 340,000 projects on it with around 551,000 users. These data points alone demonstrate that the Python ecosystem is vast and thriving. Python is intrinsically meant to be a readable, human-friendly, simple programming language. Each Pythonista's favorite poem, or at least maybe their favorite Python poem, reminds us that readability counts and simple is better than complex. PEP8, or the Python Enhancement Proposal number eight that creates Python style guide, speaks to readability in discussing such things as white space and string construction. For example, quote, this PEP does not make a recommendation for this. Pick a rule and stick to it. When a string contains single or double quotes, however, use the other to avoid backslashes in the string. It improves readability, end quote. This reflects Guido's note in the forward for programming Python volume one when discussing his design decisions for the language, emphasizing, emphasizing, quote, this emphasis on readability is no accident. As an object oriented language, Python aims to encourage the creation of reusable code, end quote. The user then, that is the Pythonista, me and you, we are always at the center of language implementation and design considerations. All this makes them Python an excellent candidate to invest in and create projects in. Python and open source, they go hand in hand. So while this is an ideal fit for programming, for scientific programming, it is also an ideal fit for programming in general. Just these past few months, Python took over the number one spot in the uh, TOB programming community index with the CEO Paul Jansen saying, Python, which started as a simple scripting language as an alternative to Perl, has become mature. Its ease of learning, its amount of libraries, and its widespread, its widespread use in all its kinds of domains has made it the most popular programming language today. Jansen then concluded by saying, the longstanding, the longstanding influence of Java and C is over. Now, I am not here to dance on the metaphorical grave of any other programming language and to do and to intrinsically state that about any language and say it's, it's to say they are dead is not ideal. We're not here to have a value war. But what I, I do um, where I do not believe that speaking in such terms is beneficial. In fact, I think all programming languages have merit and they may be and there may be particular use cases that merit making that programming language the ideal one for a specific problem. However, the themes of the themes that we've just discovered here that Python plays well with other languages. So, like for example, you can write pipe, you can write some Python and then embed it alongside your C code. For example, maybe in an embedded device. Um, this idea of Python being able to play well with other languages, Python's rich li library and well many well-maintained modules, Python's ease of use, and then its success in open source. All of this speaks to the intentional choice that Python has from the start been defined with the user, the person, the Pythonista at the core of all decisions and considerations. We see this also reflected in the passion the community has for Python. We work together, not apart or at odds. And that is what makes Python truly successful, or at least in my humble, not not unbiased opinion. So seeing how the community has been placed at the center of the language intentionally, we may wonder, how does this though position Python to grow to be such a global phenomenon? The Python language 
itself can invite users with its friendly design and rich tooling. But what, but what makes Python, the Python community not only grow, but also makes us able to maintain its popularity? This was like a question I became interested in after my time working in politics, where I started using Python. Well, after I had that first introduction using Python, I actually made a career jump into engineering. Since, as I said, I'm an engineer at GitHub. And I began to consider what tools and communities I wanted to invest in. Technology, after all, had helped me run a meaningful and revolutionary presidential campaign and subsequently inspired me to get involved in civic tech. It's, it also helped me find friends and community through such groups as Chippy and Pi Lady Chicago. It felt as if there could be more that I could do and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So let me ask you this question. How many of you have been to python.org? I know I have. Likely you go there for the purpose of downloading Python and trying to find the proper distribution you need for your system. And often you're going to go right on and click Python from the nav bar and ignore the other sub menu items like the jobs page, which, by the way, is a great resource if you've never looked at it. Or you might just ignore the tab titled PSF. Have you ever wondered what PSF is? Yeah, many folks do. And that and, and actually the PSF stands for the Python Software Foundation. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, I wanted to, I was thinking more when I became an engineer about what spaces I wanted to invest in and how I could have a bigger impact in the communities that I was investing in. And that's where I first was, was actually introduced to the Python Software Foundation, or what I will refer to as the PSF. It was with speaking with Pilates members like Lynn Root and Naomi Cedar that I began to ask, what's next for you? As in, what do they want to do next in Python? For Lynn, she had helped grow PyLadies from a few chapters in California to a worldwide user community. She helped create she helped create tools like Pip and Salt PyLadies, making it that much easier to start chapters. And she helped PyLadies really become a more easily managed open source project and greatly contributed to docu the documentation for it. For Naomi, she had worked with many communities through her work as a Python educator, her work with the LGBTQIA plus communities in Europe and beyond, and also as a well-respected Python published author. Both of these women had something in common. The passion for, their passion for the community didn't stop with a, with a specific short goal. In fact, their goals were larger and ones that were globally defined, one that related to Python and its user, and its users everywhere. And the way that they were able to take these goals and do something on the global level was by actually being able to channel their passions through the Python Software Foundation, where they became not only users of the language, but active stewards of the language and of the community. So the mission of the Python Software Foundation is to both promote, protect, and advance the language. But not only to do that, the but in order to do that, the foundation not only has to protect the language and advanced language, but it must also support and facilitate the growth of a diverse and international community, as seen here in the Python Software Foundation mission statement. The mandate of the foundation, while similar to foundations like the Linux Foundation or the Rust Foundation, where the you'll notice that there's a bit of a distinction with how some other foundations define their mission. For example, the Rust Foundation says that their organization is to be the steward of the Rust programming language and ecosystem with a unique focus on supporting the set of maintainers that govern and develop that project. So while, the, while there is still this idea of the users and, help, and having some governance and developing the language, the PSF mission I think is unique and distinct because it has an intentional focus on the growth and diversity of an international community. Again, we see that the people, the users, you and me are placed at the center of the language. So how exactly does the foundation do this? As an institution, the PSF is a nonprofit legal entity registered in Delaware in 2001. And the foundation has many obligations, including maintaining that Python is free and open to use for all, and also has various community initiatives, such as helping coordinate volunteer efforts, funding a grants program, and helping conferences in their needs, such as providing some access to monies and underwriting. Of the work that Python oversees, one significant area of legal work the PSF has includes holding and protecting the trademark. For example, this includes the Python name in the area of 
programming languages and the Python logos. The Python name is trademarked specifically in the United States. So if some folks were trying to create projects and wanted to lean in on the legitimacy of the Python brand and reputation to try to elevate their, their work, this could actually this could actually have harm to Python because it could infringe the community trust that, the, that we all have for Python. Also, as Python is free and open to use, the defense of the trademark tends to focus on the legitimacy of Python and doesn't try to micromanage small and nuanced discussions. So that trademark work is super important because it helps the it helps Python protect its reputation and the legitimacy of it as a programming language. Another trademark that the Python Software Foundation oversees is the use of the name PyCon. Again, PyCon, there's the one that specifically is branding in the United States and the Python Software Foundation oversees, is put on in again, managed by the PSF. So if some other communities want to run a PyCon, like PyCon APAC, the Python, Software Found the Python Software Foundation actually has to approve those re requirements to, uh, those, those requests to use PyCon. And there's some requirements that, the, that come with using the PyCon name, including you have to have a code of conduct. So again, we see that the Python, uh, that the Python Software Foundation continues to put community values at the core of the way in which it does its work, be it by protecting the reputation of the trademark and the legitimacy of the trademark uh, and of the language, or in ensuring that our community values are reflected with those trademarks that we oversee, like having a code of conduct. To oversee the work at the foundation, the PSF employs a fantastic staff of people, including Eva Jodlowska, the executive director on the left, uh, Lauren Crary, the director of resource development uh, on the top left in the, in, the, in the four photos in the square. To the right is E. Durbin, uh, director of infrastructure. Beneath is Phyllis Dobbs, who is the financial controller. And then to the left is Jackie Augustine, director of events. There are additional staff that's, that support finance and accounting work, event work, and administration functions, as well as contract roles for PSF bloggers. This past year, though, the PSF has grown to include no roles, such as the Python developer in residence. We have Lucas Langa for that, and the new Python packaging manager, uh, Shamika uh, Moh Mohanan. The staff really is instrumental to the work at the foundation, as the, as the programs the PSF oversees and manages are actually executed by the staff, whereas the vision of the Python Software Foundation and then in turn the programming that executes that vision is what is set by the Board of Directors. So you might be wondering what is the Board of Directors? And the Board of Directors are the folks in the community who get voted in to help make up the, the Board of Directors or kind of the, the leaders of the foundation and are the folks that work with the Executive Director and help them craft the vision of the Python Software Foundation. It's a really fantastic group of people and I'm so humbled to work with them. As you can see here, we have board members across four continents, which I think is amazing, Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. Of course, we could always have more diversity there, but, uh, oh, actually five continents, my apologies. We have South America as well, uh, De Deborah is in Brazil. So actually that the, the slide says four continents, it is actually five continents. So the board of directors is a, again, a reflection of the international and diverse community that is that the PSF in its mission says it is invested in protecting and promoting and advancing. So the PSF board of directors are voted in for three year terms. Every June, there are public elections the community can vote on where about a third of the seats on the board of directors are up for vote. Us as directors, we create the ideas for what programming the, the Python Software Foundation should create. Um, we help support the work groups and outreach efforts, such as the finance committee and the outreach committee. And we also administer the monies of the Python Software Foundations. So all this to say that the directors are the vision of the PSF. We set the theme and the agenda and the items for the foundation to work. The staff actually execute it. Some examples of previous goals that we set for ourselves included hiring a developer in residence, diversifying revenue streams for the PSF and more, of which we've hired a direct uh, developer in residence, of which we've grown our financial reserve to allow us to have a, safe, a safety net in case PyCon has some financial troubles. 
Now, as a director, us as individual directors, we should be thinking about the platform and the work that we want to do. So while a formal platform is not necessarily required, actually anyone can run for a director, I would encourage you all to think about a platform and what you want to invest in. Here we have an example of my 2019 platform, which included the following goals, to establish a formal relationship between PyLadies and the PSF and help develop a PyLadies centralized organizing body to continue the future of diversity and inclusion in Python. Um, my second goal of growing the Python Software Foundation financial security. Third goal to establish translation best practices for the PSF assets and documentation. Fourth goal to champion code of conduct revision and best practices. And my fifth goal to broaden the PSF's reach as an educational resource for Python in, in education. Of these goals, I would say that one, two, and four have been manageable and doable. However, the pandemic has shifted efforts significantly around issue uh, around goal five. While we did start a specific Python and education grant, we've stepped away and have discontinued that to help us conserve finances due to the shift of how we had to run PyCon from an in-person experience to a virtual experience. And that greatly hindered our profits that we got from PyCon. It should be noted that the Py that PyCon is a huge revenue stream for the Python Software Foundation. And it's the, those profits that go and actually fund all of our programming and pay our staff. And actually one of the most vital parts I would say of PSF that helps us in overseeing that mission, that growth and support of the international community is our global, plan, our global grants program. The PSF grants program funds various things ranging from meetup fees to supporting developer sprints to in-person in or virtual events like PyCon conferences such as PyCon APAC. As we can see from the 2019 stats, since 2020 and 2021 are a bit skewed due to the pandemic, we see in 2019 that our funds are increasingly being globally distributed with 24% going to North America and Europe, and then another 24% to Europe, then 15% to South America, 2% to Australia, but the largest amount actually going to Africa for 26%. Now, if we think about that, those figures, uh, that, that percentage of allocation, and we see that it's a, it is a truly global spread, uh, we've actually are getting more and more monies that we are lending out year over year, where in 2018, we spent 324,000 United States dollars for a grants program to support various initiatives, of which those went to support up events and opportunities in 51 countries. That's actually 22.6 more percent than what we, we funded in 2017. So our global grants program has a huge, huge, huge global spread, as well as is increasing in significance in the amount that we're giving to help grow and support our ever growing diverse community. Some examples of our grants program include supporting bold initiatives, such as our ambassador programming, like those in Latin America and Africa as well as, like I mentioned, conferences, meetup fees, and developer sprint fees, and more. So as you can see, here's some examples of, of various grants we gave in 2018 and 2019. But another example of a project funded through the PSF grants program is actually the PyLadies project. In 2011, nine folks came together at PyCon in Atlanta to discuss what it may look like to invest in expanding gender diversity in Python. And in 2011, Audrey Roy kicked off a workshop to expand the idea of PyLadies to focus on, uh, to expand this discussion and formally create PyLadies, which was a group meant to focus on education conferences and outreach for, uh, for women in the community. Fast forward to today, we have now 100 chapters worldwide of which most of that growth is coming from outside the United States and West Europe. So the initial grant of $1,220 US dollars to start PyLadies has now become a, true, a truly global organization. And this theme of building from old communities, new ones are born, is again a huge reason for why I started my PyLadies Chicago chapter back in 20, uh, 2015. The mentors that I've met along the way are really the reason why I've stayed in the community and why I continue to do the work that I do. One of my most beloved mentors who unfortunately has passed uh, and is much remembered and loved and, and cherished by the Chicago Python community is this woman right here, Tanya Shulaser. She was one of the people I met at my, one of my first 
uh, Chicago Python user group meetings. And it was her who I went to and turned to when I had questions about doing some of the data science work that I was doing in Python. In fact, she helped turn the Hitchhiker Guide to Python into a print publication with Kenneth Reitz, and then actually proposed and got all the proceeds from the print version of that to sponsor Django Girls. So again, from community, we, we build new community to fund all of these, these different initiatives that are going directly to the PSF mission. Tanya was a relentless activist for all those who needed a voice. And it's because of her that I hope, and I continue to do the spirit of the work that she taught me. As I mentioned, Pilot Chicago started in 2015. And like most groups, we meet, we organized her meetup and we are now today a community of more than 1200 members having, having ran 75 plus events. While we started with while we started with some basic content such as introduction to Python, now we're running such things as deep learning study groups with fast.ai in Python and continue to, to expand our range of programming. Now, in thinking about PyLadies, we've had some challenges like many other open source communities. New York City PyLadies organizer, uh, Rashama Sheikh, questioned some of the struggling problems Python's had with the inclusion of women. For example, there are very little women that contribute to open source code in Python, where, uh, where with the methodology of Rishama used, she found it was around 1%. And that figure then in comparison to the R community, where it's at 9.3%, Rishama wanted to ask, why is Python so far behind? And some of the reasons that she proposed included that there is no central body organizing the PyLadies project. And that there's other issues that stem from the initiatives that exist within the Python ecosystem that helps promote gender diversity in the community. So by not investing in, in projects like PyLadies and not having formal governance missions, in effect, PyLadies, which was started from a PSF grant, is unfortunately not maybe having as much of the impact to the mission of the, of the PSF as we would have liked. So as a director, I wanted to focus on growing the PyLadies community, specifically helping revitalize PyLadies to actually have a central governing body, because this can help the Python Software Foundation directly work with the community to execute things and offer administrative support as needed. Uh, this, this revitalization work, basically we got together at PyCon 2019 to talk about these some to talk about these problems of which many of the things we found was lack of financial resources and lack of just infrastructure for chapters in general. So with this workshop we wanted to try to figure out what can we do to solve these issues. What resulted was uh, what, what resulted from the discussion with, with some of these organizers and I love this photo because we have folks from across the PyLadies uh, community, we have uh, Mariata, who's in the center there, who works with PyLadies Vancouver. We have Anwisha Das, who it works with communities in India. We have Marlene, who works with communities in her home of Zimbabwe, or as well as in the broader African continent. We have Tanya Allard, who's in the UK. Elaine Wong, who is with uh, PyLadies Toronto in Canada. Uh, we have Katya, who works with communities in Mexico and some others there. But all of what we came together and we and we and what we walked away with was developing a request for comment and a proposal for a governance model. In the same way that the, that Python has a governance model and has a steering council, that steering council then is the body that the Python Software Foundation can directly work with to help, to help support whatever those initiatives of the steering council uh, the steering council sets are, then with a with a with a formal governance body, PyLadies can be directly supported by the PSF as well. What resulted then was a model like what is seen here, where much like what we see in the PSF, we have a model that has these focused groups, these work groups that look at specific uh, specific considerations, and then we have a body of advisors and then a proper leadership team. And that leadership team then is, um, that leadership team then is elected either on one or three year uh, uh, commitments. And that allows people then who are newer organizers that might wanna not take on a, a huge commitment, 
as long of a commitment, an ability to kind of get their feet wet, whereas folks who want to do more can do so by taking a longer commitment. And what we saw here actually is that we actually voted in a leadership group that is a global, a global group spanning more than four continents. We have South America, we have Africa, we have Europe and the United States or North America, my apologies. And this group then can help set the mandate and the mission of PyLadies. So Python then to me has continued to be and will always be a place where the, where the community can grow and support one another. Python isn't simply a programming language. It is a community built for us and built by us. So while it's Python, yes, I can go and find meaningful, gainful employment, but I do truly believe that with Python, we can also change the world and make the world a better place. So when we think of the future of, of the Python Software Foundation, as well as the community, I, I challenge you to continue to ask these questions. What does it mean for us to, to be responsible technologists? Do we understand the impact that our technology puts into the world? And ultimately, we must continue to ask ourselves, how can we do better? How can we support this diverse and international community of users better and make sure we show up for them? So part of the future of the open source community includes supporting the foundation, of which I have a huge ask of you all. We're actually actively seeking a new executive director. After more than 10 plus years with the foundation, Eva is going to be ending her relationship with us, is moving on in December, uh, and we are seeking an, a new executive director. And the executive director is really instrumental in helping the, the board of directors reflect on the vision and then develop the programming that the foundation takes on. You can read about that more on the Python Software Foundation blog. So we are actively hiring. If you know people, if you're interested, go check this out and spread the word. Additionally, some other ways you can help support us includes if you are able to, you can help support the foundation with our end of year fundraiser. And if that doesn't, if that isn't enough for you, you can also become a Python Software Foundation member. There's many, many levels, many of which are free, including basic, which requires nothing, but there's some other levels that where you can self certify your role as either a contributor or an organizer or, or a maintainer and then become either a managing or contributing member. And again, these are all free. So you can go check that out on the website linked here and join the conversation and help the foundation continue to reflect on our programming and do more to help support the community. My hope for you all is that you take up the call and continue to empower one another and allow us to realize our bold mission to build that diverse and international community of Python developers for not only today, but also tomorrow. Ultimately, Again, the future is built by us, for us. So let's continue to show up and do the work. In, in closing, and as my favorite astrologer, Walter Mercado says, I'm sending you all mucho, mucho amor. That is, I'm sending you all so much of my love. And I wanna thank you all for everything you do. Have a wonderful, fantastic, fabulous PyCon APAC 2021. And please, let's stay in touch. I want to hear from you. You can reach me at Lorena at python.org or again on social with my handle. Um, happy to continue the conversation in whatever, in whatever format you feel comfortable with. Just reach out to me and we'll, and we'll do it. Again, thank you and have a great conference.